And uh, again, for those of you out on television, uh, we're just an informal Bible study, and uh, we've got folks in here from uh, Kansas today and uh, Oklahoma City and outside of Tulsa. So again, we just like to remind you out there in television, if you're ever in the Tulsa area on a first Wednesday of the week and you'd like to spend a glorious afternoon fellowship and what have you, just call and make sure you check with the girls at the office that uh, the taping is on and uh, we just love to have you stop by. All right, uh, again, we want to always thank our television audience for your prayers. My, how we appreciate that you all pray for us every day. And uh, your letters, my goodness, how we love our mail time. And uh, Iris and I just, now, now you got to realize not every letter comes in has a letter. And uh, that's why we like to have people keep them short so uh, we can still read every actual letter that comes through. We may not get them all done the first day, but we'll get it done. And uh, I want people to know that, that I'm not just uh, wasting words when I say that we appreciate your letters. And, of course, your financial help. Uh, we can't pay the bills without that. And so far, the Lord has just been supplying all our needs. And uh, I asked the girls again yesterday, can we pay the bills? Yes, we're in good shape. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Uh, where was I? We're in book 77. And we've been connecting the dots. And again, the girls have been asking me the last few days, well, less people are asking, what do you mean by connecting the dots? Well, I just thought everybody knew that sometimes you'll see a blank sheet of paper with a whole bunch of dots, and uh, you take a pen or a pencil and start going from one to two to three to four to five. Then all of a sudden, something comes up that's recognizable. And uh, it's just a matter of making sense out of something that maybe didn't make sense. Well, that's what we've been doing now since uh, whenever, Genesis through Revelation. We're just hitting the highlights, not in depth like we did the first time through, but uh, just sort of a review, an overview of Genesis to Revelation. And so I'm hoping that today we can finish that uh, since this is the last four programs of book number 77. But... Before we get into connecting the dots, I was reminded again by a magazine that somebody sends me every so often from people that call themselves preterists. Now, uh, a lot of folks aren't acquainted with the term. It's not new. I used to always call them amillennialists because they reject all end time prophecy. But I found out since I'm in the ministry that a true preterist maintains that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD. And of course they go by Matthew 24 where it says that this generation shall not pass until all things are fulfilled. And from that they maintain, and they show scriptures, you know you can do anything with the scripture if you look often enough, that Christ returned and that everything was finished in 70 AD. Israel disappeared. The Jews are no more. And the people who claim to be Jews today are not Jews at all. They're imposters. Oh, it's ridiculous. But the the thing that really raised my hackles in this last article was they started it out by saying there is nothing in Scripture to indicate a gap or a parenthesis in God's timetable. And see, that's what I'm always emphasizing, that the church age is a parenthetical period of time. And we're going to be looking at that after the voice uh, turned the board. But... Uh, I just decided I'm going to confront that. I, I just can't let people get away with something like that without warning people, look out. Look out, because they're, they're highly educated, no doubt about that, and uh, they use the scriptures, seemingly, to make their point. But I'm going to use the scriptures to show that they're totally out in left field. So we're going to uh, start right now in Acts chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 13. And the background for this chapter, of course, is that Paul and Barnabas have come up from their work of service amongst the Gentiles, especially up in Antioch, where Judaizers have been coming in behind them and telling Paul's Gentile converts that they cannot be saved unless they practice circumcision, and keep the Mosaic law. So the Lord directed Paul and Barnabas to go up to Jerusalem, confront the twelve about this very thing. And after they had spent a good part of a day, Peter, James, and John finally came to the conclusion that Paul was right. 
he was sent specifically to the Gentiles. And this is one of the portions then that I feel makes it so plain that God definitely stopped the Old Testament top, top, timeline and opened it up for the church age. All right, let's start our reading in Acts chapter 15 down at verse 13. Now remember, they've been discussing these things all day up there in Jerusalem. Verse 13. After they had held their peace, James, who was the moderator, answered, saying, Men and brethren. Now remember, he's got nothing but a Jewish audience here. Men and brethren, hearken or listen to me. Simeon, Peter, has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them, the Gentile world, a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets, the Old Testament, as it is written, back in Amos, and we're going to go back and look at it. And Amos says, after this, after the calling out of a people for his name from amongst the Gentiles, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, which certainly it is as we speak, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. All right, now if you'll go back with me to Amos, and we'll see exactly what uh, Peter is referring to. Amos chapter 9. <coughs> Amos chapter 9. Now that's right after Daniel and Hosea, and then there's Amos. Those little minor prophets are sometimes hard to find. I know they are. Got it, honey? Okay. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. This is where Peter quoted. And that's what's interesting about Scripture. See, when the New Testament writers quote Old Testament, check them out. Go back and see exactly what the setting was in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. In other words, it's gone into the dustbin of history all these hundreds of years now, remember. And close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. In other words, that's the promise of Israel's total restoration to all the things promised in the Old Testament. And, of course, it's a reference to the coming in of the king and the kingdom, as we'll see as we read on. Verse 12, that they, Israel, may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen, the Gentiles, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, to do this. Behold, now this is the kingdom, see? After the church age has been called out, then God will come back and pick up where he left off with Israel in their prophecies and promises. The days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. The treader of grapes will overcome him that sows the seed. The mountain shall drop sweet wine and the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. Well, enough of that. So now then, I think my timeline is up here. So here we are. We've come out of the Old Testament promises and all the covenant promises and had Israel, of course, at some point in here, had they recognized Jesus of Nazareth as their king and their Messiah, then according to all the Old Testament, the four Gospels and the early chapters of Acts, after he had ascended in Acts chapter 1, then in would come the wrath and vexation, which we call the tribulation seven years. And then Christ would return and bring in the kingdom. All right, now here is the gap thing that these people are just furiously opposing, that God stopped his timeline before the tribulation came in, after he had ascended, and brought in instead what Peter refers to, or James rather, refers to as a calling out a people for his name. Well, that's exactly what the church age is. Israel never tried to evangelize Gentiles. They had no commission to go and bring salvation to the Gentile world until they had the king or the kingdom. Then they would, but they rejected everything. All right, so now then if you'll come back to Acts a minute and rehearse what Peter said, because I've got to make the point. 
Verse 15 again. Acts 14. Uh, Acts 15, we'll start at verse 14 for a review again, what we just read. Simeon, or Peter, had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. See? God never went to the Gentiles until Paul. Nobody. All right? And so he did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophet, after this, after the calling out of the Gentile body of Christ, then God will again come and finish his program with Israel. Well, that's my number one, that it's definite there is a parenthetical time between Israel's fall and her promises of the kingdom. All right, now then I got another one that I've used before. We'll use it again and still in Acts, change, change over to chapter 16. Acts 16. And uh, no, wait a minute, I'm not in the right place. That's not where I wanted. I thought I would write close. I gotta go back to seven. No, what happened here? I lost a chapter in my Bible. Where Paul is on the island of Cyprus. I guess I gotta go back a little further. Yeah, I'm sorry. Acts 13. Acts 13. You know, when I review these tapes, I sit there and I say, come on, come on. <laughs> but here it is, Acts 13, and uh, drop up in verse 6, on. And here we have now Paul and Barnabas just beginning their first missionary journey. They've left Antioch where the church has prayed for them and sent them out. And the Holy Spirit leads them, of course, first to the island of Cyprus. And as they go to the western end of Cyprus, they come to the major city, which, of course, was Paphos. And then when they come to verse 6, when they had gone through the island unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, who was a Jew, who, remember, Israel is going to do in the future is withstand the gospel going out to Gentiles. All right, so this sorcerer who was a false prophet was a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, in other words, a guy who had his head on straight. He called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name or interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy, the Gentile, from the faith that, of course, Paul and Barnabas were proclaiming. Then Saul, verse 9, who is now called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord now? Verse 11. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. Highlight that word. Thou shalt be blind. Now, in this case, it's a physical blindness because it is a symbolic prophecy concerning the nation of Israel as a whole. All right, but this individual Jew who is withstanding the gospel from going to the Gentiles will now be physically blind, not seeing the sun for a season, not for the rest of his life, but for a period of time. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. All right, now there we have, in symbolism again, a preview of the nation of Israel as a whole, who also were blinded because of their constant rejecting the, the gospel of the finished work of the cross and who Christ was and so on and so forth. All right, now then, just to make that point, come over to chapter, I think now I'm over 17. Yes. Now come over with me to chapter 17, so we'll see what I'm talking about, that this Elimus was merely a preview, symbolically, of the nation as a whole. Because here, instead of just one Jew withstanding the gospel, we've got a number of them. <clears throat> All right, verse 
5 of Acts 17. They're up in Thessalonica. But the Jews who believed <clears throat> not. See that? The Jews who believed not, just like this fellow over on Cyprus, moved with envy, took on them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, who was with, of course, Saul, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and sought to bring them out to the people. All right, now then, just to take it a little step further, come on down to verse 10. And the brethren, that is, the fellow believers now up there in the area of Thessaloniki, the brethren immediately sent Paul away and Silas unto Berea, which is the next little city further south, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessaloniki in that they received the word with all tradition of my, readiness of mind and searched the scriptures whether these things were so. All right, and then many of them believe. But now look down in verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki, you can either pronounce it either way, when they had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, to Gentiles now remember, they, the Jews from up at Thessalonica, they came thither and stirred up the people, and so the immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go into her as it was to the sea. So, there it's evident that the Jews would not only reject it for themselves, but they did everything in their power to keep the Gentiles from hearing it. All right, now in response to that then, the Holy Spirit leads the Apostle Paul to make a graphic statement that if you've had any contact with bringing the gospel to the Jewish people, you'll know exactly what it's talking about. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Romans 11, verse 7. <clears throat> now this is years and years later, remember. We're now into the early 60s, whereas up there in, uh, in the early uh, part of Paul's ministry, we're still down in the 50s. But here we are up in the 60s, and now Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this graphic statement. Romans 11, verse 7. What then? Israel, that is the nation. Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for. In other words, they were always looking for that glorious promised kingdom and so forth, but they couldn't see it as fulfilled in this Jesus of Nazareth. That was their hang-up. Not that they didn't believe in a king and a kingdom. They just couldn't see that Jesus had any connection to it. Okay, so Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election. In other words, that little small number of Jews who did embrace Jesus as the Messiah, which later on became the church at Pentecost and the Jerusalem church, they embraced, but they were only a small, small percentage of the nation as a whole. All right. So the election have obtained it, and the rest, the vast majority of the nation was what? Blinded. Blinded just like the sorcerer was up there in Cyprus. And that was the preview. Now, why and when were they were blinded? Well, they've been blinded for this whole period of what we call the dispensation of grace or the church age. Not all, but for the most part. In, uh, in fact, I had a call from a, uh, a rabbi not too long ago. And, uh, my goodness, he was hot under the collar to the extreme because... He says, I'm getting phone calls from California to Tel Aviv. And I said, Rabbi, I'm not on in Tel Aviv. And he says, you must be. I'm getting phone calls. <laughs> but anyway, he's probably listening. During the course of our conversation, he let me know. He said, now, Les, we do not believe one word of that New Testament. I said, I know that. I said, aren't you glad it's a free country? That's your privilege. But I said, it's a free country for me. And so I can teach the way I see it. And he had to agree that this is part of our freedom. But you see, it just pointed out that the Jewish people in general cannot believe one word of the New Testament. Why? They've been blinded, providentially blinded, until 
the church is out of the way, and then God will again pick up dealing with his chosen people. Absolutely God loves the nation of Israel. He loves the Jewish people. But you see, as Stephen said it in the book of Acts, and I think even Peter used the same word, they were stiff-necked. They just would not bow to the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. And so they've been blamed. All right, that gives rise then to my next point is in still chapter 11, verse 25. And if this doesn't show a parenthetical period of time, then I don't know how to read. Romans 11, verse 25. <clears throat> Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, let's see. We don't have the mysteries up here. They're on the other side of the board. My, how much time we spent on the mysteries in Paul's epistles. It's that whole body of truth between Romans and Philemon that was kept secret through the thousands of years of the Old Testament, through Christ's earthly ministry, through the early chapters of Acts. Nobody had an inkling of any of these so-called mysteries. Not a one of them. All right, now here is another one. See, Paul is again showing us a particular secret that was not understood until it came through the pen of this apostle. All right, so he said, I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery or this secret, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. Now stop and ask your question a minute. Who's writing? Paul. Who's he writing to? Gentiles. See? Not to Israel. He's writing to Gentiles. And so he said that you should not be ignorant, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. Now here is the mystery, the secret, that nobody really understood until Paul comes along. And that blindness, a spiritual blindness, forever? No. What are the next two words? In part, for a period of time. Now, for us... This is a long period of time. It's been over 1,900 years. How long is it in the mind of God? A snap of the finger. God's timeless. Don't ever forget that. Time means nothing to God. And so when it says here that they would be blind in part, we think, well, that more or less means a month or two. <laughs> no, it's been 2,000 years. See, but it's a snap of the finger in God's thinking. And here Israel has been blind all these 19 and some years. But now don't stop there. This blindness has happened to Israel. And what's the next word? Until. Until. And what have I called that for 20 some years? Time word. Oh, it doesn't give a month and a day and a year, but it gives a point in time. That Israel is going to be kept spiritually blind until some point in time, and it's going to be lifted. See? All right. Now, you get the picture? While Israel is in a spiritual blindness, God is doing something he never did before. He went to the Gentile world with this glorious gospel of grace, without works, without sacrifice, without temple worship. It's a parenthesis, and it's going to end. And when that parenthetical period of time ends, this until ends, what is God going to do with Israel? He's going to come back and deal with them on the basis of the Old Testament promises again. Then all of this, see, and that's why we've got it in a double line. Once we get through this dispensation of grace and the church is out of the way, God's going to pick up right where he left off. And we're still going to have Israel now in the limelight, the seven years of tribulation leading up to the second coming, which we've been talking about now for the last several months, bringing in the kingdom. Now, if you're watching your news, my goodness, I think we're getting close. You know, we're planning a tour to Israel, October, November. And after reading some of my news magazines last night, I don't know if we'll be going or not. <laughs> Because this one commentator maintains that either Israel or America is going to attack Iran before Election Day. Well, if they take attack Iran before Election Day, we will not be going to Israel. <laughs> so, whatever. And if it does happen, then to me, that's just 
the opening for the seven years of tribulation. So we're getting close one way or another. I don't set dates. You know that. But here we have a definitive statement that Israel is going to be blinded for a period of time during which God will go to the Gentile world with Paul's gospel. But when it ends, it'll be when the church is complete. All right, get back to our verse in Romans. My, my goodness, time is gone already. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until what? The fullness of the Gentiles is come in. Now, remember what James said back in Acts? that he would call out a people for his name from among the Gentile? Well, something that starts has to what? End. I mean, that's just common life. So once God started calling out the Gentile body of Christ, it's going and going until it gets to the full mark. And then what? We're out of here. It just has to be. And once we're out of here, now what does God do? He picks up where he left off with Israel. And in comes the seven years of the tribulation. Everything is now moving forward to the coming of the king and the kingdom, which we will pick up again in our next half hour. So all these things are just literally laid out so simply that first... James and Peter and John recognized that Paul and Barnabas indeed had a ministry to the Gentiles that did not affect Peter, James, and John and the twelve whatsoever. They're over there with Israel. These guys are out with the Gentile. Then we have the picture of the nation being blinded because of their rejecting all these things. And when the nation was blinded, you see, that opened the door for the Gentiles. And then Paul comes back with this graphic statement that Israel's blindness is going to end when the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. And my goodness, how many times haven't I used the illustration of a young lady who is waiting for delivery? What's the time frame? Who knows? Not generally. Nine months, thereabouts, when that little baby is complete and everything is in place, what happens? Delivery. Delivery. And that's what we're looking for. We're going to be delivered out of this mess. We trust sooner rather than later. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. 